solar and get $500 cash back with the Solar Power Co. Australia's most trusted solar brand. Solarpowerco.com.au With the right qualification, there's no telling where your career could take you. That's one small step for man. The moon might be a bit of a stretch, but whether you are looking to progress your existing career, start a new one, rejoin the workforce, or get better at a hobby, training.com.au is here to help. At training.com.au, you can answer a couple of simple questions and instantly find out what courses are available for you. It costs nothing, and it could change your life. Find your future right now at training.com.au. You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR. Another show underway. Josh Parrish joining George Deacon back in the studio. Welcome back. Thank you. It was a last minute, minute dash out of Canberra, and I'm, I'm wondering whether it was the right decision to come back, George. Uh, well, I really am. You know, but... Lockdown 5.0 about to begin again around midnight in Victoria. So uh, yeah, we're so used to it being of course i suppose living in the lockdown capital of the world but that's another matter we'll leave that uh, for others to concern themselves with mm-hmm. we've got football matters to talk about and uh, the last time you and i were together was a couple of weeks ago last week i had the good fortune to have Lockie flanagan in the studio and clearly clearly he scared the heck out of you <laughs> yeah? he must have done such a good job you thought i'd better get back that's, that's why you made the rush out of canberra Yep, nothing to do with red zones or uh, border closures. George. Just Lonnie, L- Lockie Flanagan coming back into the studio. You thought, uh oh, competition is heating up. I've got to get out of here. No, welcome back, mate. Um, listen, uh, some interesting stuff. We've got an opportunity to catch up with an Olympian, a guy who's played for the Socceroos. He's done just about everything in the game. He's coached. Uh, he's he's done a lot of work behind the spins. I remember the work he did at Melbourne City. Uh, as the City Football Group was building, building and building towards a premiership and uh, a couple of titles. And uh, he'd be smiling, watching, uh, you know, the, the City Group do some tremendous things. And by the way, overnight I hear that uh, Melbourne City have uh, another... Ac- oh, sorry, a Manchester City Group. Uh, yes, yes. The City Group yeah. uh, has notched up yet another uh, title. They've picked up a French team. Oh, wow. AC Troyes. <laughs> they bought it. They bought it in the second division, and you know what it's done. Like, like most of the other uh, uh, projects, uh, it's pr- been promoted. It's one promotion. Well, you know what they say about rising tides, George. <laughs> yes, all the ships, you know, just look a little bit tidier and a little bit healthier. Um, the reason I mentioned Tony Vidmar, though, is we're going to ca- catch up with him. He's with the Olympic teams in Tokyo and making sure that. Uh, you know, the boys and the girls uh, do a tremendous job. They're, these are exciting times, but the Olympic Games a- in Japan will not be the same as they have been for years and years and years. Um, we'll find out just how different the Games will be and just how the players uh, are being impacted shortly when we when we cross to, uh, to Tony Vidmar, who's talking to us on FNR. But before we do that, uh, let's just reflect for a moment. We've had a few days to tinker and think about everything. We've read about, uh, uh, you know, four million editorials on the Euros. What did you make of, make of the Euros, the competition, firstly? Oh, I thought it was woe. a sensational tournament and a tournament that was of a far higher standard and, and far more excitement than I expected. I mean, after the season we've had... Uh, I think it was something of a revelation for these players to actually play in front of some serious crowds for oh, once. Yeah. It seemed to raise the stakes and, and raise the intensity of games. Even if it's just an illusion when you're watching, it's still compelling just to, to, to hear the, the noise, the real noise of the fans in stadiums. It's just such a, a beautiful thing. And I, I thought the standard of play and the intensity and the uh, entertainment was a lot higher than... Uh, maybe some previous editions of the Euros have been. In in 2016, in this first iteration of this 2014 tournament, I thought we really saw the flaws in uh, the structure with all those third-place teams going through. But um, And and I was also concerned about the uh, fitness uh, and the fatigue faced by the players over such a packed-in season and then having to back up for international football. But... I was was proven wrong, and it was a a wild ride. It was fantastic. Adrenaline is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It was it was wonderful. I, I really enjoyed several from of Copenhagen. even the smaller nations. From Copenhagen, yeah. Mm. 
to Budapest, to Wembley. Uh, the crowds went wild. May, maybe not so much in Baku, in Azerbaijan. <laughs> uh, 70,000 seater, or was it? 80,000 seater? Yes, yeah, about five, of... 500 people or something. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> kind of like Marvel Stadium on yeah, an off day. Yeah, stop, don't tell me. Hey, by the way, good news. We can drop this in. It's official. Melbourne Victory have chosen to say goodbye to Marvel. They're, yeah, they're going to play all their games in the brand new A League season. Where do you think? Look, I I, I think uh, Amy Park is yeah. the place yeah. to be for yeah. Yeah. Melbourne Victory going forward. I don't think there's anything served by by staying in the Docklands. Uh, th- there may well have been a time when uh, they were pursued. By, I would have thought by Telstra, the Telstra Dome in those days. And um, it would have uh, meant a few more dollars in the kitty, which would have been tr- tremendous, especially in the early days of the victory when they were building a case to become uh, one of the, the biggest clubs in the country. Um, but uh, what is fantastic is that uh, now they can say, listen, we've seen, we've seen our fortunes and they are at Amy. So we're going to see the victory play their... Uh, their games along with Melbourne City at Amy Park. And I think that's a tremendous decision. Uh, On the subject of uh, Melbourne Victory, um, uh, there's a new addition. Someone's just signed up for a further three years, but we won't go there for just a moment. We'll keep people hanging to see who it is. But let's just go back on to the result. The final, what did you make of the final play at Wembley in front of about 59 million people? Well, look, I was um, really rooting for Italy in that game. Uh, I thought they were the deserved winners of the tournament. Uh, But I still think that uh, Gareth Southgate will have some regrets over that game. It wasn't the most convincing Italy performance in their run. And I felt the game was there to be won and England didn't take the leap, the risks required to avoid penalties and try and win it in extra time. I think extra time was... well, they didn't press home their advantage that they had at the beginning of the game and the kind of shock and awe factor of playing in front of a home crowd and the uh, pressing and intensity that they brought to those opening 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but uh, they let Italy settle into it by not trying to go for a second goal. And then Italy had that long spell of dominance. They worked their way back into the game, but uh, a few players went off with injury. Some of their best players were substituted. Chiesa, Chiesa. was yeah, yeah. a big one and you felt... Uh, it, England, their great strength is their depth and their depth of attacking players. But those players didn't see the pitch or didn't see it until, you know, the 120th minute and into stoppage time. So I think Gareth Southgate will have some real regrets when he looks back over this match um, as to why he decided to bring Jordan Henderson on and off rather than uh, try and really take the initiative uh, against an Italy side that was tiring. I, I think it's a huge missed opportunity and I don't think England's going to get a better opportunity to win a major tournament in quite some time. Well, 55 years as we were reminded throughout that broadcast, uh, the last time that uh, England uh, celebrated as champions of the world in 1966. And not only it that, was it was the last time. time they got to a major tournament yeah, final. Yeah, it's true. And so much went their way I, along the way, George. I, I think, I think, on reflection and on on the balance of the matches that were played, Italy played some of the better competition uh, opponents mm. and delivered at the most appropriate times. And if you think about it, the only team that really outmaneuvered them, dominated them, in fact, bossed them was Spain. Yeah. And and as we've now seen, if you don't take your chances when they come, when the momentum shifts, you stand condemned. And that was very much the case with England. Um, the thing that fascinated me is Italy won and Jorginho missed a penalty. How's, you know, supposedly one of the best penalty takers in the world and he missed a penalty. So... But it didn't blot... Italy's copybook. Apparently, Gigi Don and Roma completely lost track of the penalty shootout. And he, th- he thought Italy had lost when Jorginho missed. Oh, wow. And so he was quite surprised to be called up to try and save another penalty. And then when he saved it, he didn't realise Italy had won. That's so that's, crazy. that explains his kind of cool, calm reaction. Everyone thought he was doing the cool guy thing, sort of putting the sunglasses, walking away from the explosion behind him in slow motion. But it was just he had no idea that he'd just won the tournament for his country and then was stunned to find his teammates all mobbing him. It was now, you, you've, now, you've had a chance to call a number of games over the last three, four years on FNR. Mm-hmm. You've watched some 
terrific matches. You've 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 uh, had a chance to get us get to see what young players uh, how they perform in critical situations. What did you make of the two penalties that were missed by the the youngsters? Mm. And I thought both penalties. Uh, one of them was very good, just the wrong side of the post. Yeah, um, and the other one was uh, maybe the moment got him. Saka was a tremendous young kid, and I think he has an enormous future. But it was a little unfair, I think, to put it in front of him. Um, and I say that even though I'm one of those great believers that if you're good enough, you're old enough to play. You follow? Yeah. I think intuitively you think that experience counts for more in penalty shootouts. But I was looking at um, some of the guys who do research into this kind of thing. And apparently young players score more of their penalties in shootouts than more experienced players do. They're like golfers. Young golfers hit the ball, you know, as hard as possible, straight to the hole. I don't know. There's no lagging component built into this. And I I think England's approach in the shootout was very data-driven, which you can say what you like about, you know, the... Uh, maybe that being taken too far and not appreciating the the actual pressure of the moment. That's a good point. But... Uh, it was data driven. They they substituted players on late because less fatigued players score their penalties more often. That's yep. what the data shows. And us. Substitute and, substitutes. And they brought on young players and attacking players. Attacking players net more penalties than defenders, and younger players score more often than older players. So, uh, you know, the, England's tried to demystify this whole process uh, because they've had so much heartache in the past. And I think England's yet, actually put more work into their penalties than they have into their open play. And yet. And yet, um, you know, you can never legislate for what's going to happen in a one-off. You play that shootout, you know, a hundred times and maybe, you know, England wins quite a few of them, but they were still up against one of the best goalkeepers in the world. Oh, the guys. Yeah. By the way, he's just signed for Paris Saint-Germain. I mean, PSG are looking <laughs> formidable next season with some how of the do, signings they How made. do you get some of those signings on a free? <laughs> Well, I mean, they've decided to pay big sign-on bonuses and big wages, I think, wow. George. Those free transfers wow. aren't always as free as they seem. I, w- I would suggest to you at this very moment they look awfully good for a superb run mm. in the European Championship. They're trying to assemble this kind of grizzled lineup of of ready-made veterans. And I th- I have to say it looks Ramos. pretty good. <laughs> Uh, Roma and goals. Yeah, Roma, yeah, looks, yeah, looks impressive. Let's get back to the. Oh, they brought in Hakimi as well. The right oh, back. Yes. Uh, by the way, they have to spend about seventy million for him. Yeah, seventy million euros. That's Not probably, bad business. That's going to be about the sum outlay of all their acquisitions this year because the rest are on freeze. What business by Inter to have the clause in his loan contract to buy him and then sell him immediately? There you go. I mean, they've absolutely fleeced Real Madrid there. <laughs> shrewd cookies. Yeah. Uh, speaking of some shrewd cookies, what do you make of this? Uh, let's go back to the A-League now. And we've just heard news. A three-year contract has been signed by one Josh Brillante, formerly of Sydney, formerly mm-hmm. of City. Um, he's going to play for victory in the new season under Popovich. Uh, yes, he is. And that's not an altogether a surprise considering they spent time at Xanthi <laughs> together. In Greece. Yes, uh, wow. which didn't go so well for Popovich. But Brillante played out the season there and was consistently among the starters. He was in and out, but yeah. they just about uh, missed out on promotion on the, in the playoffs, I believe. So uh, disappointment. Um, at, at Zanthi for, for Josh Brillante, but he comes back to Australia now and he gets to do his two weeks quarantine here and then emerge into <laughs> potentially lockdown. So uh, I understand he's already already arrived um, mm. a little while ago. So uh, Victory are assembling a, a good side that addresses some serious deficiencies in their squad that were laid bare last season. I think uh, Brillante... He brings a certain athleticism and ball-winning and ground-covering capacity that uh, Melbourne Victory just struggled to uh, achieve. Last season they had Lee Broxham, who's not getting any younger, and these days I think plays his best football in the back line. Mm. Um, You've got... He's such a good reader of the play. That's that's why Uh, honestly so still so... Uh, impactful. Best as a, as a central defender these days, I think. Even more than a, a fullback. Left-sided one? 
Yeah, look, um, he, he can play off both feet. Um, he's he's missed to fix it, so you just sort of plug a gap mm. with him. But mm. I, I still think his, his best position at the moment is, is central defence, and he gets unfairly overlooked there sometimes because of his height and, disadvantage. And there's been another pick-up for the victory squad. Yes, young, Jason Guerrier. Jason Guerrier. Um, second spell, uh, returns to the, to the club after positive um, long stint um, under Musket uh, previously, and you can play at right back or at centre back now. So they might be assembling to play him a right of a back three, I suspect, and with a, a pair in front of him as Brillante is one of the holders. And That's right, which means that that midfield mm. will suddenly have a bit of muscle about it. They just got a bit of creativity last season. I mean, um, yeah. you know, Brimmer is a good creative and technical midfielder and especially good off dead ball situations. But when you ask him to defend, I mean, he's quite deficient in that area and I think he'll need some serious... Uh, drilling from Popovich in preseason if he's going to play as a central midfielder rather than an attacking midfielder. Um, and we saw with Butterfield, he was released um, just today, I believe, officially released from his the remaining year of his contract. And they actually were very effusive in their, their praise for his professionalism on the club website in the statement. Uh, notably so, but I, I just don't think his body was up to playing on these hard pitches and these hot conditions anymore. So That, that may well have taken a toll, but, mm. but he did um, invite uh, some tremendous opportunities to score goals and yeah. he took them. Well, well he, he did have a few big moments and a few... But the thing is, I'm not sure... Uh, when you look at the, the short highlight reel of his long-range strikes, it looks very impressive, but you don't see the amount of attempts that went into Rose's okay. head. So right. I, I think he was trying to score Sp- the same spoken goal. Spoken like a, a very, a very um, um, a hurt and uh, disgruntled uh, victory fan, I would have thought. Well, I think he was uh, trying to score that sort of goal because the uh, player up front wasn't putting them in the back of the net consistently and he felt he needed to take that responsibility on. Um, and it's a pretty low percentage uh, option from outside the area. It certainly looks good when it works. Oh, yeah. But, uh, it's pretty frustrating when it consistently doesn't. And uh, I just don't think he had the, the legs in him to be able to cover the sort of ground that Brillante obviously will. So that's um, putting a little bit of steel in the spine of the team, which they desperately, desperately need. Do you think Popovich now will start uh, adding some of the youngsters that we've seen starting to come through uh, the victory side? Well, they've signed Ben Falami permanently, which uh, he kind of struggled early on and started playing his best football once Steve Keane took the reins. Uh, but Popovich clearly sees something in him and he was only on loan from Ipswich. I think he was a free agent, so they snapped him up. Two-year deal. Um, but that's good to see that Popovich has some faith in a player like that who's shown, especially when he's donned an Oli Roos jersey, mm. Uh, but he does have one-on-one ability, an ability in in transition to really hurt teams especially. So he's a quick player, he's tricky, and, you know, uh, I'm excited to see what he can do. Obviously, Rojas is still on the books, and it's just his body that's been letting him down. He's always played well. But I'm hoping that Burkan Kurdar gets more of a look in this season because it's got to be time for him to cement some sort of starting spot if his career is really going to kick on it like we know it it probably it's, should it's incumbent on him though to grab the opportunity with both hands yeah he, but he I, can't I don't just sit on it feel you know, as he's got to go for it i don't feel as if he was ever played for Probably. long periods in the right position for him which is as a 10 mm. he is a, a genuine uh playmaking number 10 um, he, he could operate in one of those two inside forward roles that popovich likes to use in his three four three um, or behind uh, one or two strikers, uh, but shunting him out to a wing, as it was often the case at victory, uh, or playing him even as one of the deeper midfielders, I don't think suits him, especially in a team that was so defensively porous. So well, maybe he can demonstrate a bit more versatility when there's a stronger structure alongside well, him as victory well. will have time because the competition starts in October. However, the FFA Cup, the round of 32, gets underway in August, and that's not that long away yeah. now. And we're hearing that uh, they're gone from midweek matches to prime time. That's and it. We'll, that's exciting stuff. We'll talk more about the FFA Cup. Let's let's talk now the you know, uh, the Olympics. And of course, the, we had an opportunity uh, a little earlier to catch up with um, an Olympian and uh, a socceroo, someone who's graced the game and and really put tremendous work in to try and support the next generation of players. His name is Tony Vidmar, and he joined us on FNR. Joining us on FNR, the State of the Football Nation, a former Olympian, a guy who's been part of the football scene.
We know him as a Socceroo, Tony Vidmar, and he joins us currently via Japan. Compliments of, I think, Ben O'Neill's mobile phone. Um, Tony, welcome to the program and great to have you on board. Thanks very much, George. It's uh, it's good to be on. How how tough is it at the moment with all the disruption, with all the, the preparations that you guys have to go through? And we're asking more and more of our players, it seems to me, whether they are the Matildas, whether they are the youth team or whether the, they are the Socceroos. Yeah, they are uh, exceptional circumstances. Uh, but I think uh, one thing from the uh, from the outset here is that uh, in, in our in our bubble, uh, we've created a uh, fantastic environment, and um, our focus is on our daily training and, and preparing for uh, the first game coming up uh, next week. Now you've been part of this experience before. Um, how, how do you feel that uh, they're being cheated or neither special and memorable time in their lives, uh, not having access to you know fans? world coming to, to Tokyo? Yeah, look, that's a, it's an unfortunate uh, circumstance that um, all athletes have been uh, put in. But I think uh, once, uh, once the uh, players receive uh, the input, then you could see that uh, they're doing something special. Uh, and down the uh, down the years, you always look back and, and say that, uh, especially for the players. I mean, I, I have I have been um, and then that focus then switches away to uh, uh, to perform. Mm. What do you think the impact has been? The players having to wait so for the chance to actually compete in this is it uh, maybe too young to actually get their pitch? Oh, definitely. The uh, you know the the, the demand for uh, for someone to serve this month and um, the anticipation and the uh, uh, the vibe that the, the players have is, is is even more. I think that you know for for our they got to uh, together and again twelve months of uh, football experience at their own clubs. Uh, and I think with that experience that they've received, they've uh, been on board every day in, in training. So. Uh, having having these this bubble and being being so close to one another, does it mean that you follow every training or every match or every trial, whether it's Tilders or whether it's the Ollie Roos or the Soccer Roos? Oh, look, uh, yeah, you, you kind of you, you kind of focus and uh, focus on everything that we uh, we do here. So much um, hang, um, in and around our, uh, our bubble. Um, and uh, as I said, that's uh, whether they uh, fantastic what the players are uh, enjoying themselves, and uh, whether um, what's happening out out in the world. They've, uh, as I said, they're so focused on uh, on doing their country proud and doing themselves. What does it mean for Arnie to get a second crap? He was involved the last time as a caretaker coach, I believe, uh, when Australia competed in 2008. It's been long since we've uh, qualified. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think um, you know uh, Arnie talks about the uh, the stories of the you know, when he as a player in uh, I believe that was eighty eight mm. uh, and I was a coaching and uh, he still has that same that same drive. It's uh, he, he you know he he like a kid when he receives his uh, as well. So um, I think it doesn't matter if it's your first or your time to go in there thinking this is an amazing experience. You, know, you, you cannot compare us uh, being also in, in sport because it's a, uh, it's a pretty good moment. Uh, what's next in the issue on the horizon, Tony? Uh, this evening we uh, we play our second weekend against the uh, museum, so this will be a, a great opportunity to uh, to start uh, with our starting having had players starting. Gives them that opportunity to uh, to gain better minutes and uh, stick through a a good game and then get uh, ready for the set for the next uh, you know, phase three of our operation. It's been a while since you've had a chance to, to get these guys in camp. Uh, who have you been most impressed with at the squad? Seeing up close as opposed to you know, the usual scouting. Well, I that's been impressed with everyone. Uh, everyone has uh, deserved their uh, opportunity, and I don't think there's anyone who's going to shift from that or, or take a step back. And, and, and that's been the fantastic thing that we've seen already in the, uh, the understanding of what uh, what I need to do and how to play, um, and just the full commitment they're doing in every year. Uh, and sometimes they're uh, a little bit over the thunder and the drive that supply we're bringing in. And uh, as I said, we've been working uh, for, for a week, and uh, the, the next seven days are uh, 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 about the ready phase of uh, going into uh, into the tournament. We're talking to uh, Tony Vidmar, who's in a bubble in Japan with the uh, Olympic teams. Have you had a chance to watch any football? For example, you get the Euros on board. Uh, we did. Uh, we had the same uh, you know, hours and hours. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we did uh, to watch, uh, obviously, we were <laughs> with the uh, soccer rooms that uh, we had it at, uh, at normal o'clock. Uh, so, uh, look, any, uh, any kind of football that you get to uh, to watch is uh, a uh, play. And uh, so you uh, watch games, you learn games. And um, we uh, take as much as we can. So the experience of being involved in the Olympics in Japan this year is very, very different. What's what's the day-to-day -day, uh, life like? Look, um, our question is uh, you know, our, uh, the way uh, the game with the coaching staff is pretty much. Uh, yeah, we're we're limited in going out to the, uh, to the train field, and we're basically 
in our one uh, where we can't really access anything else. Uh, and as you said, there's a, a commitment from, from every staff to, uh, to to bring their best. So for us, I uh, have that uh, freedom. It's, it's an uh, unfortunate thing, but they're ready to, uh, to, to do a job. Uh, Tony, uh, can I just say from Wars FR, we're uh, very excited and looking forward to what, what sort of progress the teams make. We understand there are some tremendous individuals involved, but um, as we've seen in the Euros, it'll be the best teams and the teams with the best foot forward. Um, did you make much of the, uh, the final, the fact that England started so well and so positively, and of course Italy took all the prize? Well, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Paul, uh, you've got to uh, make sure that you don't have to peak too early, uh, mm. and that's something that uh, we'll be looking to uh, build on uh, each game that we play. And Tony, just one last one because we know we've got to let you go. Uh, it's a very tough group that has been uh, drawn in. Do you do you look on that as a negative or a positive? That is an opportunity to play in some of the best players in the world. Mm. That's a great opportunity. Uh, Grace Burge, you come into form like this, you're going to come up against the best teams. Uh, uh, I'm you consider us one of the best teams as well. Fantastic. Uh, we're talking to Olympian, and uh, these days uh, one of the senior figures behind the scenes, helping to make sure that our Olympic football teams in Tokyo are prime and ready to perform. Tony Vidmar, thank you for joining us on FNR and a very big thank you to Ben O'Neill Football Australia for making sure one call on time and two, you made it possible. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, guys, and uh, we'll speak to you. All the best.
people who understand your needs and are committed to helping you make it happen. At DKP & Co Chartered Accountants, we are more than just accountants. We are business advisors, taxation consultants and strategists that specialise in setting up businesses. We understand the client and give them the very best customised advice and strategies to achieve their goals. Visit our website dkpco.com.au or give us a call today on 03 9023 9370. Fast, proactive, personal. That's DKP and Co Chartered Accountants. You're listening to the State of Our Football Nation on FNR. along with Josh Parrish, an opportunity there to catch up with uh, Tony Vidmar in Tokyo. And um, I thought he was, he was going to give us a, a bit more insight into the Matildas, but he's being very diplomatic these days, especially in that role of his. What did you make of the game last night? I thought the, I thought the Matildas were a bit like the live stream that came out of the <laughs> Tokyo. It, was, uh, it had its moments. Mm, yeah. Disjointed. Yes, I thought... Let's not kid ourselves. The Japanese are notoriously good with technology. Mm -hmm. I can remember in 1990 in Rome for the <laughs> World Cup, they introduced the Sony HD TV and it was spectacular. Uh, it, and suddenly we saw this flat little disc actually look like a football. Mm. And that was, that was, you know, exciting. I thought technology, and we've been promised so many secrets and so many wonderful things for the upcoming Olympics that we might see something like that last night. But no, 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 no. The commentary was almost non-existent. Well, it was non-existent. Uh, it had a couple of um, breaks of play just when you were getting excited. A bit like the Matildas. I thought they started the game. The ball was moving left, right and centre, looking good. Um, Samantha on one side, uh, Ellie Carpenter on the other. Uh, Kyra Kearney Cross, uh, you know, early touches, very progressive. And I thought, hey, August well. And then suddenly, no, there goes the there goes the stream. And I was spending my time going between YouTube, Facebook, and um, uh, my my uh, uh, is it football app mm -hmm. on Telstra, trying to get uh, to catch up. And uh, yeah, I even missed the penalty. That's how much fun I had. Well, the Japanese didn't miss which the penalty. Which was the only thing that separated the two sides. <laughs> it was. Um, look. Uh, I, I found it a hard watch and not just because of the technical difficulties. Mm. Uh, it was interesting getting Michael Zappone, um off for the second half with the yeah. massive echo. <laughs> it sounded like he was Vincent McMahon ready to rumble. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to laugh. And, and I respect Michael uh, Zappone's efforts. He's done a tremendous job. He's a tremendous talent. But sometimes we're asked to do things and it, and it just, it just, it's one step too far. It took me back to the... 1983, when we were asked to do coverage of the Argentinian League on SBS, and we were given the script. When I say the script, the the, the lineups, mm -hmm. and we had to ca call the game cold. <laughs> oh and let me tell you, you didn't get much info. You know, he I was... reckon Sapodi would have been slightly ahead of us because he would have had the, all the details and some of the contact. Yeah, look, there was nothing wrong with his call, but uh, it was a little bit wrong with the audio setup. Um, his co-commentator was was crisp and clear, though. And goodness me, isn't Grace Gill one of the most gifted co-commentators we have yep. in yep. the country yep. of any sport? Yep, uh, she's fabulous. I, I think she should be the go-to for the W the League, w League in, under the new broadcast deal. If she's not in Paramount's plan, something is ap amiss. wildly amiss. <laughs> uh, she's fabulous and. Honestly, I've heard a call with a few different commentators and she seems to make the main caller better, which is usually the reverse of the relationship. Usually it's incumbent yep. on the commentator, the lead commentator, to bring their, their sidekick in but, and, and but, tee them up. But, but she it, actually it, generates more interesting discussion with well, the it, it main caller. You, it just tells you what a good colour commentator she is and and that that wonderful union, that, that wonderful mm. uh, collaborative effort... When it's done properly, um, everyone benefits, including the, the, the audience, which is fantastic stuff. So I, I could have basically uh, minimised the, the stream on my laptop <laughs> and just listened to, to Grace, I think. That would have been a better viewing experience. But I'm, I'm very confused about what Tony Gustafsson is doing with this Matildas team. He's been running experiments. Yep. And uh, yep. 
We know Ange Postacoglu was was uh, taken to the cleaners for running experiments with the national team during World Cup qualifying, infamously so, um, by Mark Bosnich and particularly Robbie Slater. So I'm wondering when the, the pitchforks will uh, come out for Gustafsson if, if the results go awry in this Olympics tournament because we, we seem to be playing different formations, players out of position. Hayley Rasso seems to be a wing-back all of a sudden. It's Let me make a, a difficult question. Um, Mm. we've got the World Cup uh, 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 2023. Australia and New Zealand are going to do something quite remarkable uh, in a couple of years' time. How important is the Olympic tournament in terms of results? If he fa- manages to find and uh, fashion the, uh, uh, the best 15 going forward, isn't that more important than the results in the Olympic tournament? Oh, of course, but this group of players is at their prime now. I understand that. And I think there will it, be some sacrifices. Even among some of the defenders, probably post-prime, if you look at Claire Polkinghorn, she can't go on forever. Uh, hopefully she'll hang on until the 2023 Women's World Cup uh, because we desperately need her to. And uh, There are few options available in central defence, few coming through. Maybe we'll have to naturalise the American <laughs> from uh, Boy and Lions and Melbourne Victory, Kayla Morrison, but... Uh, see, if, you've, see if we you've can just uh, suddenly, without batting an eyelid, you've just resorted to one of the grand old tactics that the Australian Olympians have used for years and years and years. Remember how many Russian Australians we discovered <laughs> who could suddenly pole vault better than anybody else, uh, high jump better than anyone else? Haven't been as lucky in football. And throw a javelin better than anyone else. I think closest we've come is Christian Vieri's brother. But uh, oh, <laughs> so. hey, yeah. Now that's something. That's a throwback. But but, uh, but uh, of I think course, that's... Uh, to answer your question, George, sorry. To, of course, the World Cup is more important. But this tournament means a lot to these players, especially after the heartbreak of Brazil and yes. um, how close we were, and the fact that the goalkeeper was off her line. <laughs> and I, I still think this tournament should be looked upon not as a training exercise or a preparation uh, exercise, because we've got a couple of years in between this tournament and the next to run friendly matches and do all the preparation and, and scheming that you want. This should be, you know, win now mode for the Matildas, in my opinion. Because this is a... Ch- I mean, with this talent on paper, you've got a chance of winning an Olympic medal, which is, you know, definitely worth... Uh, do you think that in the lead-up games you've seen enough of this Australian contingent that would fill you with enough confidence to suggest they will go all the way and win gold? No, not at all. Right. I, I don't think they'll okay. medal at this rate. Okay, so based on that, then what do you do with the tournament? Yeah, but I also think the fact that I'm so pessimistic has a lot to do with the approach to the warm-up games. Yeah, that's possible. So maybe they'll surprise us when the real matches start. But I, I have a few questions and a few doubts as to how familiar uh, Gustafsson really is with the set of players that he's inherited because he's... I mean, I guess there are some values to the approach of of a blank slate and, and looking at players in training and saying uh, and seeing new possibilities for them, just like Gus Hiddink did with uh, with Brett Emerton, for example, turning him into a fullback mm. and Scott Chipperfield. Yeah. Uh, but also I think we've had enough runs on the board uh, and over 100 caps for Emily Van Egmond and I think everybody knows that her best position is as a number 10 and coach after coach after coach after coach plays her as a as deep a six. lying six. Mm. And it just doesn't suit her game at all. Even if she has the um, sort of aesthetic similarities to that kind of player, it just doesn't work for her. And I feel like we're throwing that kind of learning, that long-term knowledge of this team that's been together for quite a long time out mm. the window when we're going back to, to ground zero. Look, I, I can't argue, but I just just pose a couple of little teasers up there. We saw the arrival of some new players and um, uh, Lydia Williams wasn't in goal, correct? No, she... Um, uh, who do we have in goal? That's a good yeah, question. Young, Tegan Micah. Yeah, Tegan Micah. So and we had uh, Lydia Williams came on as a substitute. Yeah, That's yeah. why. But we're giving there. we're giving some of that next tier or that next generation of player more and more playing time to to assess that whether what we see in training and don't don't forget we're not getting access to the training we don't see them training. He wants to see what they can do when the going gets tough. Indeed. And I think that's that's one of the most important things for any coach. He he's come in, he hasn't been given the ideal time, but he's been given an opportunity to blood them as quickly as possible. I thought it was telling 
that he wanted to take them for a series of games in Sweden and test them against some competition that we have struggled with time after time after time because they're physically sure. like us. They match us in so many ways. Mm. They're almost... Well, they are. They're... They're another slight. They're, a, they're an Australian with a with a Swedish accent or with a Danish accent, um, whereas the Japanese or the um, the uh, some of the Asian uh, players and, and again some of the South Americans, different build, slightly different attitude, and culturally uh, not similar to us, but we seem to be able to to to, to push them around or boss them around. Mm. Not so much the English, the Germans, and the Scandinavians, and I'm wondering whether that was a tactical ploy just to say to all the Matildas who've had a terrific run, hey, listen, we're not as good as we think we are and we've got a long road to hoe and are you with me? Yeah. And I, that's the contract, I think, that he, he wants to sort out ASAP. I, I do agree that the weaknesses, particularly against Scandinavian nations, um, I, I wonder what that rests upon. I think the the physical... Uh, advantage being diminished is is a good hypothesis and we need to find a way to beat these teams mm. uh, because we just don't have their number. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's going to be interesting um, to see how the, the Matildas I, I fare wanna, in this. I want to see us, if, I ca- if we can, I want to see a bit more smarts. Mm. I want to see us um, outmanoeuvring teams, you know, by tactically playing a game or, or, or a style of play that puts pressure on others and allows us to showcase our wares and our and our skills because a lot of our players have a certain crop of skills. Mm. The finishing and the poise, that's that last layer. If we can get that right, especially in the younger ones, then going forward over the next 2 years, then we've got something in our in our makeup that uh, will be pretty exciting, especially for the opening round of the World Cup 2023. Yeah. I I I may be being uh short term short term with my well not just negative but also uh, a little bl- uh, blinkered with my kind of short term thinking no, here but no, no. you know that sometimes I, I, I don't think I just blinkered because you're, re- you're an ex referee you're a you're a football caller you love the game you've seen a number of different styles of football and and you know how they mix and mash and and and, and fit together so I don't think you're being too critical but I, I understand where you're coming from and, and what you're asking. Sometimes I just think we're making it too complicated for these <laughs> players. It is football. It's just sort of play to their strengths, play to their natural instincts. Don't put them in, in all sorts of new positions because the players look a little bit confused as to what they're being asked to do. At what the does moment. Pep Guardiola want uh, his players to do? Play instinctively. I'm not sure that's true, George. No, I, he does. I think he wants them to play cerebrally. He's, oh, he says, yeah, you think? Oh, he wants to you actually drill think them. they think? Well, he no. wants to drill them so consistently and so in such a detailed manner that it does become instinct but the concept is as he says in the have uh, loves dogs as he says in the uh well yeah <laughs> as he says in the city documentary the whatever it takes or whatever it's called yeah, whatever it takes. um he says uh, it's football is uh, i think it was kyle walker or someone going, or maybe it was fabian delf going and saying you know simple stuff he's really angry and then um <laughs> that's, guardiola that's was saying no 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 guys guys Football is so complicated, you guys. It's like, you know, it's, it's not simple stuff. Um, but I don't know if in a national team environment where training time is so limited, mm. whether such an ambitious kind of game plan works as well as in a club environment where you're with these players every day. And, you know, maybe Italy well, have recently is, disproved that. But. but this is the concentrated time that he needed to have them, remember? Because of certain sure. things that had fallen his way. And, of course, an Olympic tournament that it's been held back... By rights, we shouldn't be playing in Olympics in, in 21, should mm, we? No. This is the 2020 Olympics. I'm playing catch-up. At, at Tokyo, and it's a year later. So um, in some respects, he is fortunate that he has an opportunity in an international tournament to test them. So let's find out. Let's find out. Speaking of testing, uh, we've got the, uh, the Oli Roos, um, um, you know, also in this tournament. Um, let's see what you make of how they might look when the first game runs up in a couple of weeks' time because the Olympics are only a couple of weeks away. Indeed. Uh, who will we likely to see in goal? Will it be Glover? Will it be one of the youngsters that f- formerly was a Melbourne City youth player? Or are we going to see someone brand new? I think it will be Tom Glover. He's the most experienced of the, the goalkeepers in the squad. There's 
Um, a guy uh, Young called Joey Jordan. has handled himself beautifully. Yeah, there's Jordan Holmes from from Ebb's Fleet, who has some English lower league experience. Ashley Maynard Brewer is at Charlton, and he's highly rated as well. But I do think Tom Glover will get the nod. Um, okay. But it may depend on on training sessions and things. We're not Listen, producing. I'm a City man, but I haven't been impressed by his efforts all year. Glover. Yep. I I, I don't know what's happened, but there's a some something that I didn't see last year in his play. And it's a and it's a doubt, mm. and that's not a good thing for a keeper. I also think he has a little bit of, pro, uh, of a problem off set pieces, and particularly free kicks. Um, the way he sets his wall up, he doesn't give himself enough of a view with the ball, and that's um, something that's cost City before, and it cost the Oli Ruse in the last qualifying tournament. That was quite a long time ago now, mm. but I'm hoping that he addresses that very specific part of his game because I never feel confident when he's shaping up to... Well, he's ordering his wall about on a free kick. You mentioned the Matildas coach. Mm. What do you make of Arnie? What's he going to ask and who's he going to put together? Is Nathaniel Atkinson likely to play uh, for the Oli Ruse as a right back or is he going to be looking to be, to be playing as a, as a winger? I think there are too many options up front and not enough At in defence. Um, and there was a real selection question over the right-back slot in the last qualifying tournament. Um, they played uh, Alberto Del Grosso there, who isn't anywhere near the selection now. Um, I don't think he really worked out. Um, they've got Thomas Deng as a right-back option, of course. Will he be a right-back or will he be the centre of the I back? think you put Thomas Deng in the centre of your defence, given how experienced he is. And alongside Harry Suter, you've got a really physical, tall guy, thread off set pieces, and a guy who's really quick and can cover in behind. I think that's a good blend. Yep. Um, he, I think Joel King is a good shout for the left back role. Um, they play. So we play four at the back or three at the back? I think four. I think Arnie's most comfortable with this four two three one. Or though he has exper- experimented with a couple of different formations with the Socceroos, but. Nathaniel Atkinson will be asked to get forward and I think he's going to play as an attacking right back much in the Ryan Grant or Fran Karasic more recently yep. mould uh, because Arnie relies a lot on his, particularly his right fullback or one of the fullbacks to get forward to provide an extra option um, out wide in attack and there's this little passing triangle they like to play to try and release the right back on the overlap. So I think that will be Nathaniel Atkinson's job and even though he's playing a defensive role, I think we're going to see him more in the opposition half than we are in the defensive. Which is, which is much of him. what we saw in his early stint at City this year before he got the injury. That's it. And then when he came back, he played more as a right back. Um, what about that midfield? We've got Riley McGree, you've got uh, Jean Rowe, you've got uh, Connor Metcalf. Are they all likely to play together? I think that's a a, a good selection. Um, they, they have all vastly different mm. qualities. If if what, you were to one's pick a schemer, that through. the other ones that that really cheeky can do anything. That's the that's the Riley Scorpion King, and Connor Metcalf has that amazing engine, mm. and and he too has shown some tremendous uh, maturity in his play of especially over the last twelve months. I think McGree and uh, Jean Rowe are almost certain to start. It's the third midfielder that I'm not sure, whether it's Metcalf or whether it's maybe a slightly more defensive uh, holding player like a... Devlin? Devlin or even a Keanu Bacchus. Okay. Um, who could also play yeah, in that yeah, role. Yeah, yeah, That's a good So point. it's, I think, a matter of the opposition that they're facing, um, whether they go for Metcalf who can provide a few more late runs towards the edge of the box and will give you a little bit more... Uh, forward momentum or whether they go with a more conservative option who's going to stay deep and just recycle the ball and, and do those cautious, um, tactically important things. So how bold like. do you go at the front? Well, I mean, I, I think you just pick the best players and players are informed. I mean, Nadjarine's come into the selection. Azani will be back. Which yep. Azani rocks up? I, I think that's what I'm most excited about with the Ola is getting another look at Azani. Uh, we haven't seen him for so long. And, you know, we've heard all sorts of things. We've had managers say various unkind things about his work ethic and his attitude. So that's a big question mark over Arzani, but he might see this as as an opportunity to put his name out there again and and really kickstart his career that's rather stalled after that. If you're a window shopper, yeah, if you're a window shopper, you'll be watching the Olympics to see the talent that's, uh, that's there on offer. Um, and this is a tremendous opportunity for all of the Australians, whether they be Matildas, mm. Ollie Roos or Soccer Roos. This is it. And we've got the overage slot uh, filled by Mitch Duke. Yep. So he will start, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
I think well, he's you don't a big bring body. Unless... He is a big body, and he's skillful, and and I think he can carry them. He's that he's that sort of build. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like uh, jump on board, boys. We we're going down this particular pathway, and that's exciting stuff. But there are plenty of options. You've got Caleb Watts from Southampton, who's looked exciting in in limited minutes. Uh, Runo Piscopo looked very Piscopo. impressive. Yeah, impressive Piscopo last time he was playing yeah. for the Oli Roos. He's got that guile and craft and so, okay. one one ability. So does Piscopo come in instead of Connor Metcalf, or is that the sort of plug that you? I you think can... he has to play further forward on a flank. Really? Because he's, he's that kind of... Did Wellington use him that way or did they use him more as a, as a, uh, as a link player from the, 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 back, the back line to the forward line? Well, because some play... of those transitions that he was involved in were wonderful he and inventive. He was usually playing in their kind of 4-2-4 four, four almost as one of the wide pair, but they, they tuck in. It's almost a box midfield, the 4-2-2-2. Two, 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 two. So it was more of an attacking role, I suppose, but it did involve some defensive responsibility mm. as well because they only had the two in midfield, whereas I think the Socceroos are more likely to play with, with three. Then again, if you're playing mid, McGree is one of the midfield three. He loves to get forward so much that sometimes his average position on those sort of heat maps is actually further forward than the striker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, um, I think if he's used, Biscopo will be on the left most likely. Then again, if you're trying to field him and Arzani at the same time, you probably give Arzani the opportunity to cut inside and Piscopo maybe plays on the other side, tries to whip a few deliveries into Duke. We're running through a series of names and, and, and the, the squad still has other players that we haven't mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and that, that tells me that Arnie has got a lot of questions that he needs to address. Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, there's J. Rich Bugaloo, who we, I don't know anything about, but uh, he's a big dude <laughs> and he's a defender from Crystal Palace. Is he, he, is, he can't possibly be bigger than Suter, can he? I don't think so. He might be broader, though. <laughs> he's a monster, that guy. Um, and if he gets an opportunity, um, I'm excited to see uh, what he's about uh, rather than just judging him based on how he looks, mm. which, you know, probably shouldn't do. I never judge a book by its cover, as they say. Lockie Wales has made it, um, given the expansion of the squad, they've been able to add a few names. He just missed out initially. There's Dylan uh, Pirias. Uh, you Pirius. say, you say Pirius. it better than him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dylan is an interesting mix. He's, uh, he's shown flashes of doing something quite wonderful. And he's the sort of guy that if you put Nathaniel uh, alongside him, they are very, very similar players, and yet they have a, a complete skill set different to the other. Mm. Uh, I think Pierias is an out and out attacking right right winger, and yet he's been played as a as a right back. Yep. And Nathaniel has the ability to to defend, but he too likes to be a right right half, who can almost be a right winger in the old parlance. He, he's a, they're an interesting set of mixes. Great engines. Both have got great engines. Both love to attack, and and I think Pierias has actually got a better eye for goal than Nathaniel even though Nathaniel has surprised me a couple of times. Well, Dylan's shown great goal-scoring ability at Western United, so oh. I think he'll probably be used as, an, as one of the front three if he is. I, and I think given He won't his, be an impact player? You'll, you'll, you'll use him as a, as a starter? No, I, th I think as an impact player, I think okay. he's his best role in this unit because of that incredible speed. And, okay. You know, you've probably got more technically gifted players to choose from to start the game when the spaces are a bit tighter, but... After the hour mark, that's where you'll unleash Dylan the beast. Pierias <laughs> to try and exploit tired defenders. You don't want uh, him running at you. So yeah, he's he's an exciting one and he likes to play – when he's playing up front, he likes to play on the shoulder of the last defender and make those runs in behind, which, you know, he scored quite a few goals from. So uh, he's definitely a, a, a good uh, impact sub option. And then, of course, Marco Tilio has made it as well and r r barely need to – to expand upon Marco Tilio at this point. I've talked about him so often on FNR, but I, I love the kid and I think he's a whiz. So. You love him for a reason, just as so many other fans do too. He's uh, He's been a revelation. And we haven't we mentioned Nick D'Agostino either, who's always played well for the Oliveros, yeah. regardless of A-League form. Even when he was back at Brisbane and, uh, mm. you know, getting barely any first-team football and, and missing chances when he did get in the side... He still killed it for the Oli Roos. So whatever it is about playing that underage football, he seems to dominate. 
So I wouldn't be surprised to see him actually start games. Um, Arnie seems to love him. He scored big goals. He came up with the biggest goal that actually got us qualified for the thing. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him get serious minutes as well. Yeah, exciting times. So let's see. We're a couple of weeks away from an Olympic tournament for uh, some very talented players. And as we touched on earlier, they're right in the shopping window and uh, there'll be clubs looking uh, left, right and centre to see what Australian talent uh, resonates and captures their eye. It'll be, it'll be quite fantastic. Uh, speaking of uh, capturing our imagination, I'm very thrilled as we get through the last minutes of uh, State of Our Football Nation on FNR to talk about the newly refashioned FFA Cup because we cannot finish tonight without talking about um, the FFA Cup, the, the nation's only knockout tournament. Uh, the, the Football Australia, when it announced this tournament a number of years ago, I'm sure didn't have an idea that it was going to be embraced as it has been embraced. Mm. And they've, there's been some tweaking going on in the last uh, 12 months, six months or so, and we're now hearing that the, instead of being weak or uh, midweek games, they're going prime time. That means on the weekend when football really should be played. I like it. And, and it's going to be uh, broadcast onto the new streaming platform that Channel 10 will have, which launches early in August, and that's the one called Paramount+. Plus. And, of course, we're now hearing more and more about what 10 is intending to do. And I'm hearing behind the scenes that there are production crews already being gathered, which tells you that uh, the, the work has started. Now, now it, uh, it uh, remains to be seen how it will look on air and what, what techniques and, in, and indeed what, uh, what technology they're going to bring to the, the contest. I think that's exciting. Um, we've already seen the round of 32, some blockbusters announced. Mm -hmm. um, COVID or no, there are some exciting games. The last thing I want is to miss out on some of these blockbusters. Sydney Olympic, which has been in the news for the last couple of weeks for all the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. has an opportunity to knock the socks out of Sydney FC when they meet early in August in the round of 32. And there's a game coming up, I think, on the 29th of August at Lakeside Stadium. I don't know how it ended up in my calendar, but it's a <laughs> 3 o'clock Sunday game at Lakeside and it pits the current premiers, Melbourne City, against one of the grand old names in football in this country, and that's South Melbourne FC. So, wow. It's, it's exciting, and hopefully we'll get plenty of fans down. And it won't end there. You've got Hume in the lower leagues doing some tremendous work over the last few years, mm -hmm. playing Port Melbourne. Yeah, those, those sides can't see enough of each other. one another. <laughs> no, um, that's going to be a good matchup, and Hume were very lucky to, to hold on to the three points. But, George... I think we're going to have to call it now because we've got such a busy night tonight on FNR. Speak to me about what's coming up tonight. So we've got If You Know Your History coming up straight after us. Uh, we've got George Katsanis uh, joining. Get out. He's unearthed some new National Youth League footage. Katsanis, that winger that used to show us his skills uh, on the, what was that program we used to do? Oh, the Pioneers. Yeah, yeah, yeah go on. So Katsanis is back. That's yeah, great. A pioneer. And we've also got Greg Werner on um, to uh, talk on a, a more sombre note about the passing of, of two former soccerers recently. And okay. at 7 o'clock, we've got Avondale on a, uh, this is a sort of makeup show because we weren't able to do the show on Tuesday. Uh, so we'll have plenty of guests from the club there. They've got a Doherty Cup match coming up on Tuesday night against Port Melbourne Fantastic. and they're top of the league in NPL Victoria. It just keeps getting better for My them. My only word to you is make sure they use the QR code That's as they it. make their way into the studio. That's it. And uh, and finally, we've got the Lions Den, which Get is going to be over Zoom. So it's going to be another virtual Lions Den this week. Uh, but can't wait to chat to women's coach Dan Fodden. We've got the captain, Di Pikulovsky. We've got uh, Robert Stan Bolziev, uh, former A-League talent, of course. He's had a really interesting career and he's one of Preston's favourite sons. And then finally, we're going to catch up with the uh, newly crowned president of the club, uh, David Svetkovsky. So, can't wait. David will be uh, on his best behaviour, I'm sure. Yes, indeed. Well, he's...